Hello YouTube, Dave here again. A while back I started a series of videos uh, aimed at people that are new to Dungeons and Dragons, particularly those who have started uh, their D&D journey with 5th edition. And the idea was to sort of look at uh, some of the major differences between uh, 5th edition and 3.5 D&D, which is another very popular version of the game. Uh, the idea started because I was getting ready to run my first 3.5 game in nearly a decade, and I just thought it would be a, sort of a cool series of videos to work on, but unfortunately I kind of ended up getting uh, away from that uh, series, and I want to get back to it, because there's really not a ton of stuff left to do. Uh, mainly, I don't want to go into every single difference between 3.5 and 5th, uh, because there's just a lot, and not all of it's interesting. I just want to touch on some of the more unique things, or some of the more interesting things, at least as far as I see it, when it comes to differences between 3.5 and 5th. Now, for the purposes of this video, like I said, it is aimed at people that are already familiar with 5th edition, so I'm not really going to go into explaining the 5th edition side of things. Uh, I know I've had uh, someone in the past uh, that wasn't familiar with 5th uh, edition, but familiar with 3.5, uh, ask me, you know, if I could start to incorporate more 5e elements into it. And I might actually do uh, a video just going over some of the key things from 5th edition in a later point in time. But this is really meant to be focused around 3.5. So the last two videos that I did in this series a while back were all dedicated to the Player's Handbook. Today I want to take a look at the DMG. There's a couple things in here that I really want to focus on. Again, I don't want to go into absolutely everything because that's just there's it, it's just not going to be a fun time but there are two things in particular that I was look when I was looking through the DMG it's like oh yeah that might actually be kind of interesting to talk about so the first thing that we're going to do here is we're going to go into our handy dandy dungeon master's guide and we're going to go to page 107 because one of the things that third edition had uh, and that even the editions before it didn't really do uh, they had the ability to create NPCs using similar guidelines to how player characters are created. Uh, but they didn't necessarily want every non-player character that the Dungeon Master designed to have the same abilities as the player characters. Uh, they did want the player characters to feel like they kind of stood out or were, you know, different enough. Or if you came across an NPC that was using player character classes that it would make them sort of more of a threat. So they actually created a series of NPC classes. Uh, so the idea of the NPC class is to sort of give you more of like an archetype. Uh, now what's interesting is that in 5th edition, uh, with starting with the, uh, the second, the essentials kit, uh, it did introduce the idea of like sidekick characters as these generic NPCs that could be used to fill roles if you're running like a smaller group, for example. And they kind of function similar to these NPC classes in concept. You have the like the 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 the, the warrior type. You have uh, the spellcaster, which could be either arcane or divine, and then you have sort of the expert. Uh, type of character. So they've actually kind of reintegrated this concept back into 5th edition, uh, but it is interesting to see, again, sort of where we kind of started with that. Uh, so like I said, these are meant to be weaker versions of like classes that player characters really aren't meant to use. Uh, these are essentially the challenge rating or the effective character level uh, that an NPC would have is actually one less than their level of the class. So for example, if you were a third level adept here, you would have an effective uh, character level of only two because the class is pretty bare bones compared to what a player character would have. Uh, so we'll start with the adept here. This is one of my favorite ones and the one that I probably used the most. Uh, so the adept is kind of meant to be used more for like the tribalistic, more of like a shaman type of character. So they don't have the resources of like a wizard or like they're not necessarily as faith-based as a cleric or, you know, as, as nature-oriented as a druid. But these might be things like your orc shamans or things along those lines. Uh, so what they actually have is the d6 for hit dice. So they have the attack progression of a wizard, which is the weakest in the game, but they have a slightly better hit dice. Uh, they had a good will save, they had the ability to summon a familiar, and they had spell casting ability. And what was cool about the Adept is that their spell list is actually taken from both the wizard 
and like for both arcane and divine sources. So they'd have abilities like cure light wounds uh, at the same time that they had the ability to cast spells like burning hands. So it was actually, again, a really interesting uh, NPC class. And the one that I said that I like to use the most because out of all of them, it's the one that stood out the most as just not being a weaker version of an existing class. It was more of just this sort of amalgamation of things. And I actually really liked it. Uh, you also had the aristocrat, which is basically your noble class. And I've got to be honest, I actually completely forgot that they called it aristocrat. Um, and even though I was, I've, I've been running a 3.5 game that has an NPC uh, that would have like a noble background, for some reason I always remembered it as being the noble class, uh, but it is the, technically the aristocrat, and they are essentially kind of your, they're, they're meant to be like your wealthy nobles, but there's really nothing to them beyond that. They have slightly better abilities than the commoner class, which is meant to be your average citizen, the type of person that you might find just wandering the streets of cities like Baldur's Gate or Greyhawk. Um, and it's interesting, I would love to see like how a 20th level commoner is, is comes about. Um, but like I said, the option is there. And the commoners, again, they have the D4 hit dice, so they have the weak hit dice, a wizard's attack progression. The aristocrat has like the rogues or the, the, the cleric or druid's attack progression, so they actually have a halfway decent one. Uh, but other than that, they really don't have any abilities. Like, I think the only thing that they really have would be like a higher starting uh, wealth if you're making one from first level than any of the other, uh, any of the other classes. And like I said, we got the commoner. They're just commoner. Again, nothing really, uh, unique about them there. Uh, and then we've got the expert. So the expert is actually, again, kind of another cool class, uh, because one of their big things is that they have a decent amount of uh basically skills so they're you know more like the skill focused you'd have maybe like a blacksmith and apothecary um you know some sort of like craftsman type of idea and again what's also interesting about the expert is that they actually choose uh what skills are considered to be class skills for them so they can choose any 10 from the list technically making them one of the more versatile ones because they can choose whatever skill that they want when you're making them at first level uh, and they actually have again a decent amount of skill points that they can use um, so yeah if you had again like trades people uh, in your party for example then this is the class that you would want to use for them and then we have the warrior and the warrior is again it's kind of a stripped down version of the fighter but they have uh, the proficiency, weapon proficiencies, and armor proficiencies of the fighter. They do only have a D8 hit dice instead of a D10, so they're not quite as strong as a regular fighter would be. Uh, and the, But they do have the attack bonus progression of a fighter, so they actually get the good attacks uh, going, starting at, you know, with every level it actually increases, unlike all the other classes there. So, again, they were pretty good. These were kind of more your grunt troops. Um, so, again, you might use the warrior class for your standard encounters if you were going up against, like, some goblins that are actually trained, or orcs, or even the city watch would be usually made up of warriors, and then, like, a guard captain, for example, might actually have uh, the fighter class. But overall, it's just a cool concept um, you know, with these NPC classes. I didn't use all of them. Like, I don't think I ever made a commoner or an expert or even uh, an aristocrat, but I definitely did use the warrior class as well as the adept class because I actually thought that those were kind of cool. So again, when you're, it gives you sort of a, a framework to customize the NPCs in your games. And it's something that, again, I would like to see 5th edition fully commit to, uh, bringing back. But the fact that they have, like, the sidekick characters now is definitely a step sort of in the uh, in that direction. So, again, really, really cool stuff there. So that is the first thing that I wanted to focus on. So the second thing that I want to talk about, and it's just going to be, again, very, very brief. I'm not going to go through all of them here. Uh, but in 3rd edition, you had prestige classes. So... Prestige classes were something that you had to work towards as you're going through your regular character progression. Uh, each prestige class would have a set of requirements, usually uh, a combination of uh, base attack bonus or skill proficiency, like a certain amount of skill points, investor skill ranks 
in certain skills as well as certain feats that may be required, spell casting abilities, things along those lines. Uh, they were something that you would actually multi-class into, although they didn't follow the traditional multi-classing rules, which is something that I did discuss before. So prestige classes, you didn't have to worry about balancing your levels. They didn't count towards you gaining experience point penalties. Uh, fifth edition didn't, doesn't have prestige classes, but what they do have is most classes will have some sort of archetype that they choose either at first or at third level. So things, for example, like the, the warriors, uh, the fighters like champion, uh, or the battle master or things like the, the, the rogue having like the assassin or the arcane trickster. Well, some of those were things that were derived from prestige classes all the way back in 3.5 D&D. For example, we've got the Arcane Archer, which is a fighter archetype that you can play. I believe it's in Xanathar's Guide. Uh, it's either Xanathar's or Tasha's, but I'm pretty sure it's in Xanathar's Guide. Uh, we also have the Arcane Trickster, so this is sort of where these came from. Uh, so again, these were things that you actually had to work towards, and a lot of times they did require you, or they were more, e they were easier to achieve, if you had like actual multi-classing already. So for example, uh, for the Arcane Trickster, their requirements uh, would be that they can't be lawful, which is fine. Uh, they are supposed to be a trickster after all. So they have skill requirements. So seven ranks in Decipher Script, Disable Device, Escape Artist, and Knowledge Arcana, as well as the ability to cast Mage Hand at least one Arcane spell of third level or higher. So yeah, this was actually one of the tougher ones to kind of qualify for because of the skills involved and because of the ability to cast like a third level spell, which most classes would get, arcane, like spell casting classes would get at fifth level. So this is one that you were meant to be sort of a higher level to get. But again, it was something that you had to work towards. And I kind of liked these, I, the prestige classes got way out of hand in 3.5, although the ones in the Dungeon Master's Guide, by and large, are pretty well thought out and balanced. But later, with other books that came out, the idea was basically anything we can think of, just throw it at the wall and see what people react to. So prestige classes definitely got out of control for a very, very long time. Uh, in fact, it wasn't until around 2006, uh, which was only two years left before 4th edition came out, that really any thought went into, well, how do we actually incorporate these into the world? And they would actually start doing a bit more like thought out write-ups on the classes. But like I said, it is kind of cool to see where they kind of started from. So there are a few here that you might see that, uh, again, might be somewhat familiar. Uh, if you look at like you know uh, fifth edition and some of the archetypes that they have for classes, we got the blackguard, we've got the uh, the duelist, um, again some of the eldritch knight again, which is a really cool one, one that I really like. There's also the the mystic thurge, I believe is in here as well, and the uh, the mystic thurge is one of my favorites because they are a combination of uh, arcane and divine spellcaster. Uh, in fact, when I first started my 3.5 game, uh, the group was small enough that I decided to include a uh, an NPC, and the NPC that I made was actually trying to become a Mystic Thurge because um, the party was lacking both a healer and an arcane spellcaster, so I was kind of trying to fill uh, fill two gaps. But this class made it you know easy to do that. So again, just a really really cool concept, and they they definitely got out of hand. But some of these early prestige classes were, were kind of cool. And again, these were things that technically anybody could try to qualify for. So it's not like they are tied to a specific class only like they are with the archetypes in 5th edition. Uh, but yeah, so again, like just a cool uh, sort of thing that was thrown in there as well. It, it got out of control. Uh, they had to rein it in towards the end, but the, the overall idea of prestige classes at the very least in 3rd edition was an interesting one, and some of them were actually really, really cool and really well thought out and designed. So that was the second thing that I wanted to go over. There's one more thing that I want to focus on in this video. For the third thing that I want to talk about, I want to talk about customizable armor and weapons in 3.5. So with 3rd edition, one of the big things that the game was sort of built around was the idea of really being able to customize what magical equipment your characters have. Um, so that could be done through buying and selling, uh, as well as I mean, like trading or some other stuff. But we look at like in 5th edition, for example, most of the magic items 
that you come across or that you would get in a campaign are ones that you find in treasure hordes or taken off of uh, enemies that you've defeated, but there's not really necessarily a ton of like buying and selling of magic items in fifth edition like there was in third edition. So third edition, any like town, city, or any type of settlement had a gold piece limit. And that limit was basically, that was the most amount of money that you could spend on any single item. So for example, you wouldn't be able to make um, you know, the best possible suit of magic armor or, uh, you know, the most powerful magic weapon in like a village or hobbit, like you would have to go to one of the, the major metropolis cities in order to do that. Like you wouldn't be able to do it in say greenest, but you could maybe potentially in water deep, uh, that sort of idea uh, cities and settlements would also have a, an asset amount. Uh, which was sort of meant to give you an idea of like the maximum amount of money that the town could pay out or that the settlement could pay out for players selling magic items. Uh, although I'd be honest, that's not a feature that I really used uh, that often. But like I said, we did have some cool stuff when it came to customizing items here. And I'm actually going to use weapons, I think, as the example, because that's kind of one of the uh, the easier ones to to go through here. So... Uh, we're going to take a look at our weapon chart here, and we're just going to zoom in just a smidge. So we can see here that we've got for our weapons, you have got a weapon bonus here, and it goes all the way from plus one up to plus ten. However, uh, as you see from like plus six and forward, there's actually an annotation next to them. Uh, to let you know that there's sort of a uh, a caveat to having an item with that enhancement bonus on it. And basically what the what it is, the way that this works is that a suit of armor, a shield, or a magic weapon in 3rd edition D&D could have a magical enhancement bonus, which for weapons adds to the attack rolls and damage rolls, and for armors and shields would actually add to the bonus that you get for that armor. That can go from plus one to plus five, plus five being the maximum. In fifth edition, uh, the maximum was actually only plus three, so they kind of dropped that down uh, to go with sort of their, their lower scaling as far as like bonuses and stuff goes. Uh, but in third edition, you can go all the way to plus five. So for plus six and above, uh, those are the maximum that you could use for adding special abilities. Again, customizing the weapon. So the, the way that it works, if you take a look at the melee weapon special abilities here, you can see, for example, that a flaming weapon has what's called a plus one bonus next to it, which is the base price modifier. So to add an ability to an item, uh, to a weapon, it has to be a minimum of plus one. So if you want to make a plus one flaming longsword, for example, you would have to look at the plus one, then you would look at the flaming, which also carries a plus one uh, for the market price modifier, and then you would look at that, you would have to add those together, and you would actually look at it as now a plus two weapon, plus one being the first plus, being the first plus one being from the actual enhancement bonus, and then the second being from the modifier here. So a plus one modifier on top of making a plus one weapon, you would have to pay 8,000 because it's now effectively a plus two item, and it only goes up to, so plus 10, is the maximum uh, that you can do, and you can't have an enhancement bonus greater than plus five. But you don't actually have to have the full bonus. So you could you could make, if you wanted to, a plus one weapon with a total of like plus nine in special abilities added to it. Uh, I know players that would make uh, a plus one weapon that had all the elemental damage on it. So they would make a plus one, uh, like a plus one. Uh, you know, flaming, frost, shock, uh, and was there another one here? And like thundering. Uh, so like plus one, flaming, frost, shock, and thundering. That's four plus one abilities on top of it. So that would be the equivalent of a plus five weapon. So again, there was a lot of customization that you could do uh, with the items. And I think it was kind of a neat uh, concept overall. Uh, again, it's something that allowed you to design the weapon and the armor that you wanted with the abilities 
that you wanted on there. And it was a pretty easy way of doing things. I know it sounds complicated, uh, but basically it's just you add the enhancement bonus to the effective bonus of the item and that's what you, or the ability, and that's what you use to determine the, the price on it there. So again, you could do some really, really cool stuff with it. You know, you can make a plus five uh, keen Vorpal weapon. Uh, and a Vorpal, I believe on a roll of like a natural 20, it can just automatically decapitate. Uh, so like that being a plus five bonus and having the keen ability, uh, which is an initial plus one, which doubles your critical threat range. So that's plus six there. So I, I was wrong. You can't make a plus five Vorpal uh, keen weapon. I was looking at the wrong ability, but you can make a plus four Vorpal Keen weapon, and you've got a pretty pretty nasty item there, especially on something that has a wider threat range, you know, that you could sort of uh, exploit as it is. So yeah, so again, really cool stuff. It was an interesting concept, and uh, one of the things that was kind of fun to do was to design some of these, like, weapons and armors, especially for me as a dungeon master when I was trying to equip my, my big bad, like, boss characters, uh, you know, for each of the adventures that I was designing. One of the things that I loved to do was to actually sit down and like look at the armor abilities, look at the weapon abilities, and try to customize as much as I can using sort of some of the guidelines that they have laid out for character creation. So again, it was a really interesting concept. It's something that I think would be kind of cool to see come back in 5th edition. Uh, the ability to sort of customize your weapon with the abilities that you want to throw on there to, you know, enhance them in a certain way. Again, you can't quite pull it off, I don't think, the exact same way, only because uh, with 5th edition, for example, you, like your armor and magic weapons, their pluses cap out at 3 instead of 5. Uh, so having, you know, abilities, they could only have like an effective plus 1, 2, or 3 modifier, really, because the, the idea is that you take the maximum amount of enhancement bonus you can have, and you, you double that to include ability sort of concept. But I don't know. I think it was interesting. Hopefully I explained that well. It is late at night when I'm doing this, and my back's been bugging me again, so I haven't been getting a ton of sleep, but I hope that makes sense. If you need me to clarify it anymore, uh, please let me know in the comments below. But those were some of the, again, the interesting differences uh, that 3.5 has to 5th edition D&D, and those were the big ones that I wanted to talk about. So the NPC classes, uh, a little bit, just dipping the toes just a little bit into prestige classes, and talking about the way that you could actually customize your magic items back then for the experience that you wanted to have with your character. Overall, like I said, I thought it was kind of a, an interesting way of doing things. So let me know in the comments below, are there any other items from the Dungeon Master's Guide that you may want me to uh, discuss, uh, some other differences between editions, or if you want me to do this sort of similar idea for other editions, like 2nd edition, 1st, uh, Beck Me, or even like 4th edition, let me know that in the comments below as well, because I, I absolutely would love to do that. Anyway, uh, thank you guys very much for watching, I hope you enjoyed, and I will see you all next time. Take care.